Gallup Institute has really three main pillars. Uh, the first pillar is drug policy. The second pillar is citizen security. And the third pillar is inter international cooperation. And we believe that all these issues are integrated. So we know that issues around drugs and the prohibition of drugs and the war on drugs fuels issues of citizen insecurity. And we know that to deal with citizen security, you have to deal with international cooperation. So we know that these three issues come together, even though we keep them analytically separate. So I'm actually Canadian. I'm trained as an economist and a political scientist. And uh, I've spent the last 15, 20 years before coming to Brazil and, and running IGHP, working on issues of violence and small arms and conflict and uh, also issues about how insecurity concentrates increasingly in cities. And I spent really the 90s in Africa, mostly in, in conflict zones uh, across Africa, including Sudan, Uganda, uh, Kenya, also during the election violence, but also in the South and the West. And then I moved to Latin America and worked in Colombia and all over the Andean region during the, the, the peak periods of the conflict in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and then I did my PhD in Sri Lanka and parts of India and spent some time in the Asian region looking at the conflicts there. And then wandered through the South Pacific and into the Caucasus and then ultimately back to, to Brazil. And what was astonishing to me across all of these very different parts of the world, which have in many ways unique characteristics and, and great variety and variation, was in fact that there were some common trends occurring. And those trends had to do with deep structural factors that seemed to be conditioning certain aspects of violence. Uh, for one, we saw, and I was seeing increasingly over time, a concentration of violence taking place in cities, and particularly in large, uh, fast-growing cities, but also in intermediate-sized cities, sort of mid-sized cities, less than 500,000 people. So the first big theme that we, I could see across the Americas, Africa, and Asia was this concentration, not just of populations and movement of populations to cities, but also the emergence of new kinds of organized violence and interpersonal violence in those cities. The second big trend that I was coming across these various environments was a kind of hyper inequality that seemed to be emerging. Of course, the world has always suffered from various forms of inequality. Of course, there's always been haves and haves and have nots. But what we were seeing in some of these areas was a very rapid evolution of, of, of this inequality, especially again in cities. Uh, and this was precipitating in a way new kinds of insecurity and, uh, and, and, and turbulence and transition. A third more recent dynamic, which I think has been extraordinary to see, it's really been the last decade, has been the advent of new technologies and, and mobile connectivity and also internet connections. Uh, we've seen an unprecedented growth to, to the point where today we have 6 billion people with telephones. We have 2.5 billion people connected to the net. Uh, and this isn't just a northern phenomenon. This isn't something that's only taking place in the United States or in Western Europe or in, in Australasia. This is actually a phenomenon that's taking off in Latin America. It's, it's emerging rapidly in Eastern Africa. I think Kenya is one of the fastest growing environments right now uh, for mobile telephony, but also across Asia. Uh, and what we see is an increasing pace and speed and scale of connectivity of populations and an awareness of populations about the disparities and inequalities that they're facing. So these three kinds of trends, coupled with issues of climate change, which are impossible to deny, uh, coupled with the concentration of youth populations in many of these settings uh, and the growth of youth populations, has created an accumulation of risk factors uh, that in many cases has precipitated certain forms of fragility uh, and in many cases also fragile cities and violence concentrated in these cities. And so we live in a world right now where 600 cities account for two-thirds of the global economy. So cities have a huge importance, not just for politics, but also for, for the economic and, and, and social factors that condition our everyday lives. Uh, and so cities, I think, are, are registering on the landscape as being probably some of the most signal opportunities, but also challenges we're facing in the 21st century. I often talk about the urban dilemma. Cities have great promise. They can offer extraordinary opportunities and access to services and uh, their fonts of cultural action and their, uh, their where things happen. But cities are also concentrations of risk and insecurity. And they're areas where an aggregation of risk factors, the accumulation of risk factors, can result in an explosion of violence. So 
after all this time of travel, spent many years crossing the Americas and Africa and Asia, I ended up in Rio, in Brazil. Brazil, a country of 200 million plus people, and Rio, a city of 6 million plus. Uh, about 1.2 million of those people living in favelas and slums and in low-income, highly dense areas of the city. Uh, and to me, and I think to others who have been watching Rio over the last decade or so, Rio, in a way, is the canary in the mine. Rio, in a way, signals uh, much of what we're going to see, I think, not just across other cities and countries of Latin America, but also in countries and cities of Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Why? In Latin America, we have a high concentration of the population living in cities. Whether we're talking about Central America, whether we're talking about the Andean region, or whether we're talking about the Southern Cone, upwards 80% of the population of Latin Americans are living inside big, intermediate-sized cities. In other words, Latin Americans have made their demographic and urban transition. In, in Africa, the percentage is about 50%. Roughly 50% of the population lives in cities, 50% lives outside of cities in the countryside. And in Asia, it's below 40%. But it's inescapable that the world is moving towards an urban century. It's obvious that we're moving towards a more highly urbanized population. And in Rio in, and, and in Brazil, we have, in a way, the logical endpoint of that urbanization. So to me, Rio represents, in a way, the future of what other cities in Latin America and across the rest of the world are gonna be facing. But Rio has other factors that make it particularly interesting and important from a global perspective. Not only is it a highly urbanized and dense population, it also has some of the highest rates of inequality in the world. Its Gini coefficient, the proportion of the population, the distance of the richest to the poorest is one of the highest in the world. Rio also has uh, an extraordinary pace of urbanization. So there's continuously people moving into the city. So it's not just the size, but the speed of the population moving into the city. Rio also has a high concentration of youth population. So there's a high density of young people, uh, and, and we know that young people are often associated with higher rates potentially of violence, where you have high concentrations of young unemployed youth. So Rio has this aggregation of these different risk factors in a way, a hyper aggregation, that lends itself to having particularly high rates of violence. Um, so, where are we today with, with Rio? There is today a discussion about whether Rio is in fact facing a conflict or not. Now, on the one hand, you could say Rio isn't at war. It doesn't have all of the classic attributes of what you might see in Darfur or you might see in Baghdad in terms of the political opposition between a rebel group and a state, a rebel group seeking to take over the state. But if you start scraping a little bit, you see that actually Rio does have many attributes of conventional armed conflicts today. For example, Rio has a, a homicide rate of about 25, 26, or approaching 27 per 100,000. The rate of violent death that qualifies as a conflict, according to the World Health Organization, is 30 per 100,000. So Rio is just below the rate, the international agreed classification of the, the death rate for an armed conflict. Rio also has, um, but it's well above the 10 per 100,000, which is classified as epidemic. So Rio has a homicide rate, a violent death rate, intentional death rate of, of 25 to 27 per 100,000, which is two to three times higher than what qualifies as an epidemic. It's also at least four times higher than the global average. So Rio already experiences a high rate of violent death, well above the global average, uh, almost qualifying as an armed conflict. Rio also has armed gangs, armed gangs that are well organized, that have clear territories, uh, that have fixed revenue sources. In many ways, they echo the attributes of what we see with rebel groups around the world. Uh, Rio also experiences pitched battles between different groups, between the state, between the militia, between the armed uh, traffickers and others. So we see, in a way, open armed conflict with young people effectively caring brazenly AK-47s and M-16s and pistols of all varieties, not 10, 15 meters away from the main transport corridors of the city. So there are many factors that suggest that, in fact, you know, Rio does lend itself to being potentially uh, equivalent to a, a conflict situation. Um, now, if you look at the discourse in Rio, it's very much a war discourse. The governor 
of, of Rio, the current governor of Rio, talks very openly of going to war against the traffickers, that we are at war as a community. Uh, the public secretary of security talks about taking the fight to the gangs and, 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 and combating these threats. Uh, in the newspapers, we talk openly about armed conflict in the streets of Rio. Uh, and that kind of mentality, the symbols, the metaphors that are used, uh, the icons that are invoked, uh, right down to the insignia of the military police, which are all about a muscular, securitized military response to perceived threats. Really, it, it perpetuates within Rio a sense of siege, a sense of war, a sense that the elite are against the poor living in favelas, a sense of dichotomizing these two groups. So there is, in fact, a, a, a discourse and a rhetoric in Rio de Janeiro that is perpetuating and deepening this sense of warfare. And I think this is raising fundamental questions, not just in Rio, not just in Brazil, but around the world, of what is a war and when, what is not a war. When are we facing an armed conflict and when are we not facing armed conflict? In fact, are we going to be experiencing in the future these kinds of unconventional situations of pitched battles, of high rates of violence, of young children and young boys recruited into milita military type structures, but it falling short of the international classification of war? Because these situations, because they aren't qualified and described as armed conflict by international organizations or by diplomats in the United Nations, they have different rules than what we see in war zones. Internationally humanitarian law, the laws of war, don't apply in a situation like Rio de Janeiro or Ciudad Juarez or in Honduras or in El Salvador. In fact, what we're talking about is a situation of human rights and national jurisdiction. So it falls short. And that raises, I think, some really fundamental questions for the humanitarian community. How does the humanitarian sector respond to a situation like Rio of unconventional violence? What are the normative or legal structures that they can appeal to? Are aid workers allowed to have immunity in these situations? What if aid workers work with traffickers in order to negotiate access and be able to provide life-saving assistance? Is that not illegal according to domestic law if you have no international legal resort? What are the operational implications of an aid agency to work in a situation of high chronic violence like Rio de Janeiro? What are the kinds of lessons that they can apply from other war zones? I mean, I think these are the kinds of questions that are uppermost in the minds today of the aid community as they struggle to understand how to engage in these new fronts of Central America and South America. And I think the lessons that are going to be drawn from places like Honduras and El Salvador and Mexico and Guatemala and Brazil and Colombia, the lessons that are going to be drawn from the aid community, including World Vision, including the members of Red Lack, I think are going to be uh, extraordinarily important for aid agencies all over the world, since I think places, of Af places across Africa and Asia are going to be confronted with similar kinds of problems in the coming decades. Mm -hmm.